So this week, this week's parsha, the parsha of Shlach, which means sending or send. We have the famous story of the spies, the spies that Moses sent to Jews were taken out of Egypt, received the Torah. Then Hashem wants to bring them to Israel, the promised land where he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are really already traveling towards Israel. And right before they go in, they're like, let's, they approach Moses and they say, let's send some spies, some scouts to scout out the land, which is a very normal, typical thing to do before you conquer a land, right? That's just the, the normal thing to do, the regular thing to do to send spies, to scout out the land, to see how to comp, how to go about, how to conquer it, the risks involved in it, plan the plan how to go in, how to enter, where to enter from, and to find out in general about the land. All right, so Moses chooses 12 prominent individuals for such an important tax, task. He appoints them to be messengers, he sends them, they leave for 40 days and then they return and they start giving the report and everything sort of spins out of control. They start giving the report, in the middle of the report, colleague mixes in and they sort of have an argument about what they saw, what they witnessed. And then the whole, the whole nation is like, oh, why do we have to get, why do they have to go to this land anyways? And then Hashem gets involved and is like, okay, they don't want to go, wander in the desert for 40 years. And then they're stuck in the desert wandering for another 40 years until eventually for another 38 years, because in the 40 years is included the first years of the wandering. In other words, the year by Mount Sinai is included in the 40 years and time until getting to Mount Sinai is, is counted in. So meaning 40 years from leaving Egypt and they, they wanted that 40 years and only 40 years later are they accepted into, they've actually entered the land of Israel. All right, so this week we are going to maybe do a little, um, approach the class a little bit different. Usually we do not read inside too much from the Torah portion. We usually speak about the commentaries but this week, I, want, I would like to read a few verses, the verses of, the, of, Moshe, of Moshe appointing the spies, what he asked them to do, what they responded, and sort of the, I guess we could call the argument that broke out between the spies and Kalev. So I'm going to share the screen, and we are going to read inside those few verses. Right. Um, by the first um, source, it's quite a few verses, but uh, so let's see. So Moshe, after appointing and choosing the spies, Moses sent them to scout the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up this way in the south and climb up the mountain. All right, go through. He's telling them where to start from. Now, what are you, what should you... What should you look out for? What are you scouting out? What's, what do I want you to, to pay attention to, to gather information about? You shall see what kind of land it is, meaning is it a land that produces strong people? And the people who inhabit it, are they strong or weak? Are there few or many? Right. The first thing, you want to conquer a land, you want to take over a land, you have to know who you're dealing with. Are you dealing with strong people or weak people? Are there many or are there few? And then and what of the land they inhabit? Is it good or bad? And what of the cities in which they reside? Are, there, are they in camps or in fortresses? Meaning, do they have walls around their city or they live in cities without walls? Then in those times, a primary protection for a city was if you have walls around the city. That means the city is much stronger. It's much harder for an enemy to 
to, 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 to win a battle against a city that has a wall. So are they, do they have, are, do they live in camps or fortresses? Do, do they live without, in a walled city or a city that doesn't have wall, a wall? And what is the soil? Like, is it fat or lean? I guess what's produced by the soil. Are there any trees in it or not? You should be courageous and take from the fruit of the land. So if we want to just summarize, there's two general things that Moshe told them to collect information about and to report about. First of all, the, ty the, the type of land, meaning, uh, first of all, about the people in the land. Are they strong or weak? In other words, how to conquer the land. Then also about the type of land. Is it God promised a special land, a land which, like we see soon, is a land that flows with milk and honey? That's a, a, obviously a metaphor, but the idea is that a land that produces many good fruit. So check out the land. So those are the two things that he told them to say in that order. In, in verse 18, he told them to find out about the people, verse 18 and 19. 19 about how strong they are and 20 is more about the the quality of the land of the land and the fruit okay then the next few verses from 20 through 27 describes how they went and how they traveled and scouted out the land and 27 is when they return so in verse 27 is where they are reporting back to Moshe they told him and said, we came to the land to which you sent us, and it is flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people, which, which is great, this is exactly what the Jews wanted to hear, how it's an amazing land. However, the people who inhabit the land are mighty, and the cities are extremely huge and fortified. And there we even saw the offsprings of the giant. So they said, however, conquering the land not going to be an easy task. A great land, but conquering it won't be easy. As they're saying this, these were the 10 spies talking. Kalev, who, was, who did not fall and did not follow the plot of the, of the spies, the other 10 spies, he says, Kalev silenced the people to hear, about Mo, to hear about Moses. And he said, we can surely go up and take possession of it, for we can indeed overcome it. But the men who went up with, with him said, the other spies said, we are unable to go up against the people for they are stronger than us. They spread an evil report about the land which they had scouted telling the children of Israel, the land we passed through to explore is a land that consumes its inhabitants. People are dying. And all the people we saw there are man of stature. There we saw the giants, the son of Anak, descendants from the giants. In our eyes, we seemed like grasshoppers, and, and so, we're, so we were in their eyes. So if we break up these verses that I brought here, we could break them up into four parts. From verse 17 to 20 is Moses describing what he sent, uh, describing the mission, what he wants them to do. 27 to 28, 29, I didn't quote 29, but through 29, is them reporting back to Moshe. And from 30, and verse 30 is Kalev giving a counter report. 31 to 33 is them finally saying that no, we would not be able to go and conquer the land, right? And then after this conversation, this between Kalev and the spies, the Jews lost interest. They're like, why are we going here? Let's just return to Egypt. Who, who needs the land of Israel? And then Hashem get mad. And like we said earlier, Hashem told them, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to wander for 40 years in the desert. Okay. Typically, when you send someone on a mission to find out information, it's because you're not sure of the information. You're not sure what he's going to come back and say. Because if you would know, you probably won't have to, have to send someone to find out the information. And if he comes back and he gives you and reports back to you, and he, you know, the intelligence that he collected, the information that he collected, 
So you accept it. And even if you don't like the results that he tells, tells you, you don't get mad at him necessarily, or you shouldn't get mad at him. He did exactly what you asked him. Let's say, I don't know, let's say you're looking to uh, open a new business. So you ask someone advice. Is this a good place to open the, a business? Is, this, is there a need for it? Is there a demand? So if he tells you, yeah, there's a great demand, this is the exact, the best location to open it, you're happy. If he tells you this business, there's no demand for it. There's already three of the same thing in that area. No, no one needs a fourth of the same, you know, the same type of store. So you might not be too happy about his report, but you definitely won't be angry at him. It has nothing to do with him. He just reported what he saw, right? You're not mad at the person. You, you, he reported he, he reported to you what his opinion is, okay? So seemingly that should be the same thing here. Moshe said, find out about the, the land, the, the people of the land. In other words, how easy it is to conquer them. And the land, is it a good land or not a good land? They come back and they, that's exactly what they report. They reported, it's a great land. However, the people who, who live there are, Tough people, it's not going to be easy to conquer. Right away, Kalev jumped in. What's wrong with what they said? They're reporting what they saw. After all, they were asked to, re to say what they saw. And that's exactly what they're doing. So there's nothing to get mad about. Why did Kalev jump in? Why did they say, no, 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 we'll be able to conquer the land? What red flag did they see and what they're saying that... That, um, that, that, he, that he felt the need to, to jump in and say we'd be able to conquer it. True, after Kalev said that, then they sort of, then they said that, no, we won't be able to conquer it. And it's an impossible land to conquer. And that actually eventually made the Jews, um, the, the general, the, the, the nation to, uh, to, to lose interest. But until then, was there anything wrong with what they said? Until the end when they actually like gave their, their decision that it's not a good place, it's not a good land to conquer. But until then, until the la those two last verses, in their in their initial report, was there anything wrong? It seems like there is something wrong with their initial report. And that's why Kalev jumped in. But reading the verses, what should be wrong with the initial report? Seemingly, they're just fulfilling what Moshe wanted them to do. True, maybe it's not the report we were expecting, not the report we were interested in, we wanted to hear, but that's that's just what they that's just what they what they what they what they saw. They could only say what they saw, they could only say the way they perceived it was sending it to them in order to hear what they what what they want to what 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 what, what they saw. It, it seems kind of strange that. We ask them to give a report, and then as soon as they come back and give a report that we don't like, everything spins out of control. Hashem's like, okay, you guys went to wander for 40 years. What did they do wrong? What was their sin? What did they do wrong in their initial report? So some may say, you're right. In the initial report, there was nothing wrong. They said over what they said. But by the end, they started to give their own, they added their own two cents. They said it's not a good land. It's not a land we'll be able to conquer, and and therefore it's a, it's it's not worth it. Go, it's not worth going for it. So even though in their initial report there's nothing wrong, but after Kalev jumped in and said we'll be able to conquer it, and after then they responded that no, we won't be able to conquer it. So that was their sin. That that's what they said wrong. No one asked them their opinion. They were asked to give a report, to report back to Moshe what they saw not to give their opinion if, the, if we would be able to conquer it or not be able to conquer it. That's, that's one way of understanding their sin. However, there are many commentaries that do understand and do think that already in their initial report, there was something wrong. Right away in the beginning, the way they reported back to Moshe, they didn't report a factual report. They reported a slanted report, a bias report. They already made up, they plotted against entering the, end, the land of Israel. 
and therefore they reported in a certain manner that they report in a certain manner that should remove and that should make the Jews lose interest in entering the land of Israel. But what? What about the report was slanted? It's not true that the nations were strong. They were strong. It's not true that it was a great land. And like they said, a land of milk and honey. It is true. So what was slanted? What was wrong with what they said? So this is something, this is the question that we're going to discuss. In the initial report of the spies, what was wrong with their report? Seemingly, they just fulfilled their mission. They were asked to collect information about the land and they came back, they returned with the information. But it seems like right away, Kali mixed in, Hashem got mad at them. So what's wrong with their, with their report? Okay, so we're going to go back to our source sheet and see what the Ramban, Nachmanides, writes, how he explains what was wrong and how the report was slanted. How they very, very silently and almost, you can read the verses and not even realize, but they added in their own, their own thoughts and they slanted the report in a way to discourage the Jews from going to Israel. So I'm going to share the screen again. And share, uh, wrong screen. Number two, the second source on the page. So he says the following. Now, on all this, they said the truth and gave a report about those matter, matters which they had been commanded to find out. Therefore, they should indeed have said, as in fact they did, that the people that dwell in the land are for are first and their cities are fortified. If it's true that it's a, that they're strong cities and there's walls around the city, and it's true that there's strong people that live in the land and nations are strong, so that's exactly what they should say. For it was their duty to bring back words of truth to them that sent them, to the one that sent them. And Moshe had commanded them to see whether they are strong or weak. And what the cities that they dwell in, and what are the cities that they dwell in, what are they like, whether in camps or in strongholds. So where's the wickedness? Where, where do we see in their report something wrong? It says, but the wickedness of the spies consisted in saying the word Ephes, the Hebrew word of Ephes. In the beginning of verse... Twenty-eight over here, they said. However, Ephes, which could be translated the Hebrew word of Ephes, that's out in the, in the Torah. So it's translated here as however. Over here in the Ramban and Nachmanides, the translator translated as nevertheless. They wrote nevertheless the people that dwell in the land are first, which signifies something negative and beyond human capability something impossible impossible of achievement under any circumstance. Thus, the spies told Moshe, Moshe that the land is, is fertile and surely it flows with milk and honey and the fruits are good, but it is impossible to fight against the people because they are first and the cities are fortified and very great. So going back to what the spies said on, on, on verse 27 and 28, what the Ramban is saying that how they didn't give a factual report. They gave a, a biased report. They added in their own opinion into the report. They said, we came to the land which he sent us and it's flowing with milk and honey and this is his fruits. Okay, so there they answered about the land. 
What should be the next thing? The people who inhabit the land are mighty. If you're giving a factual report, you said, you want us to find out two things. So here are the answers. The question, which is actually the second thing Moshe said. Question number two, what is the land like? The land which you sent us is, is, is a great land. What are the people like? The people are strong. But they didn't write that. They added in this word, however, which is implying that it would be impossible for us to conquer the land. Here they're giving in their own opinion that this is not worth it. It's too hard. However, this it's a, it's a hard it's a hard um, sale. Let's just move on. Let's look for something else. So that is where that's the red flag that Kalev picked up on. That, however, and he's like, no, we'll be able to go up there. And then the spies responded, no, we will not be able to conquer it. But here they actually revealed their intention of trying to discourage the Jews of taking over, of conquering the land that Hashem wanted to give them and commanded them to conquer. Now, all right, so according to this, already in the, in the beginning, in the initial report, there was something wrong. So that's one, perhaps one explanation. What was wrong in their initial report and why it wasn't a dry factual report, it was rather a report, a biased report, which is, which is not what they were sent for. They were sent to collect information, not to give an opinion. Entering the land was not up to discussion. That was something that Hashem promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was more of a question of how, not a question of if. And since they decided if, and they said it's not worth it, so that was already a sin. And that was that's that was the problem with the report of the of the angels of the messengers. Another another approach to what was wrong in their initial report, the Rebbe once spoke and he and he made a very interesting observation, which is as follows. As we said earlier, Moshe asked them to find out two things and in the following order. The people that, the people that inhabit the land, are they strong or weak? And are the cities strong? Which is a question, more of a military question, we could call it, a question how to go about conquering and taking over the land. And then there was the second part, a second, the second part of what he wanted them to find out, which is, is the land a good land or not? How is the land? Is it a fruitful land? Is the soil, is the soil a good soil that you could plant good fruit with or not? So those are the two things that he asked them to ask about in that order. When the spies came back, and reported back to Moshe, they changed the order. They first said, it's a great land. They spoke about the land, how good of a land it is. The second thing was that the people are strong. All right, big deal. They changed the order. Who cares what order they report back? Moshe said it one way, he said, Moshe asked about Moshe first asked about how to conquer the land, then the quality of the land. The, and the messengers changed it around. The scouts changed it around. They first answered about the quality of the land. Then they, an, then they answered about the, the, the type of people that live there and how, how it's easy or hard it is to conquer. But what's the big deal that they just changed the order around a little? So the rabbi says, no. In this change, there is a, a very, very deep and fundamental difference. And this is actually the red flag that Khalif picked up on. And that's why he jumped in and said, no, we'll be able to conquer it. What's the difference? 
what's the difference if you first ask about the quality of the land or you first ask about the how to conquer the land? Conquering the land was a mitzvah, was a commandment. Hashem promised our forefathers to give us the land. And this is the nation he took out of Egypt in order to bring Mount Sinai and then to the land of Israel. So that was a commandment of Hashem. Then there is the reward that the land that he's giving us is a great land, is a very a fruitful land, enjoyable land, the quality of the land. So Moshe said, first thing, find out how to fulfill Hashem's wish, how we could go about taking over the land. Then also find out about the quality of the land, which is technically the reward. But that's that's the secondary. That's the second step. The second thing I want you to find out. However, the Miraglim, the messengers, the spies changed it around. They changed the order. They first spoke about the reward. What's the quality of the land? Then they spoke about the, the how to go about fulfilling Hashem's command of entering, of going into the land of Israel, taking over the land of Israel. They changed the order, meaning what was their primary focus? Is it worth it or not? What's the reward? And then what is how to go about it? If the reward is a secondary or a primary focus, is, very, is intrinsic to the success of the mission. Why? What, sometimes there's things we do because we know this is the right thing to do. And hopefully it'll pay off. It might pay off more, might pay up less, pay off less. But since this is, this is the right thing to do, I'm going to do what, what, what I know and what I think is right. The reward is secondary. I'm not going into this based on the reward. That, is, that will come later. However, if you go into something based on the reward, then right away you start thinking, okay, is it worth it or not? Is it, is it a worthwhile deal? Should I, am I going to, is the effort worth the reward that I'm going to get for the effort? If I decide it's worth it, then I'll do it. If I'll decide that it's not worth it, then I won't do it. So again, if you go into something because of this is the right thing to do and reward is important and great, but that's secondary. So then you would do it regardless whether you think the reward is worth it or not. But if you go into something because of the reward, so then you would, you would right away start, you'll only go into it if you think the reward is worth it. So that is exactly the difference between if you ask first about the type of people that live there or first about the land, the quality of the land. Moshe said, find out about the people that live there. Let's see how we could properly do what Hashem wants us to do to move into the land of Israel, to go into the land of Israel. Then also find out about the reward, find out about the quality of the land. The spies changed it around. They focus, the first focus was on the reward, what type of land it is. Then they spoke about how, about to, go, how to go about it. Now, this is the red flag that Kali picked up on. If you're going about fulfilling the commandment because of its reward, the end would be that if you decide it's not worth it, you won't end up doing it which is actually exactly what happened. Kali was right. Right after they gave the report and Kali mixed in, they said, no, we won't be able to go there. 
Why? Because they started off with the reason. They started off with the reward and their, their, their opinion, their, 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 their conclusion was that it's not worth the reward. And therefore, it's not worth to, to go up, to go, to, go, to go into the land. So that is already in their initial report, we see that there's something wrong. Their whole approach to fulfilling the commandment was wrong. Their approach was from the reward. And therefore, the problem of approaching a commandment based on the reward is that if the reward doesn't, if, you, if the person decides that the reward doesn't pay off, he won't do it. So we see that in a small change of order, which question they answered first, in there lies a very deep and profound concept, how their whole approach to the mission was flawed. And this would obviously explain the question that we started off with, that all they did was report back to exactly what Moshe asked them to do. So if all they're doing is reporting back, what's wrong with that? You don't like the report, so therefore you punish someone? The answer is, if they would have reported back exactly what Moshe asked them, exactly how Moshe asked them, then correct, no one would be mad at them, even if we wouldn't have liked the report. But they did not do that. They reported it back in a different order which as we're explaining now is not just a different order, it's actually a whole different approach to the mission. An approach that is somewhat, an approach that's flawed that doesn't, that, 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 would, that could eventually lead to not fulfilling and not wanting to enter the land altogether, which is actually what happened. All right, so we started off with this question of why get mad of at the at the spies for fulfilling what you asked them to do and we said that in their initial report there was something wrong in their initial report there they were the report was uh they 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 the, the, the report was biased they and in this we had two explanations the first explanation was from their band that said that when they said however they were trying to indicate that oh it's a great land however don't even think to step close to step to step anywhere close. enter enter so that however was already moving on from a factual report to an opinion and they were not asked to give an opinion they were asked to give a report the second approach that we had the second explanation was from the Rebbe where he explained that where he explained that the, the problem was that they changed the order and their focus was on reward and not doing what Hashem wants. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, sure. I have, um, I read it differently. Um, I respect what you're saying, but for me, there is a change. They, on the first, in numbers, they say that the people are mighty and they're mightily people. The spies come back and say they're fierce people. And so they change the ground rules relative to what they saw because maybe they're duplicitous. They don't wanna do it because they were afraid, but they didn't really fulfill their obligation to come back to Moses and tell him the emet about what there is. So I find that troublesome because just the change of the fundamental word for mighty Mighty doesn't mean fierce, all right? Mighty means a proud people, um, in, in other words. And up in the front, they, the spies say, well, you know, people don't survive there, you know, and it's terrible. But that's not what, you know, what, what was originally happening if we understand that these were mighty people and it seems that they were giants, you know, and they were intimidated by them. And so they're misleading the people Israel as well as, as Moshe by coming back with that kind of report. Um, interesting enough, you know, we, we studied um, this Pasha, um, Rabbi Sachs, the title is, it was a crisis in confidence. And that was sort of the subtitle for the, uh, for the Devar that he gave for this. So, 
the, it was a, it was you know it was it was a lack of confidence, and they colored, you know, to to either protect themselves, or maybe to protect you know the Hebrews from going in. But they weren't fierce. They were a mighty people, and that's not necessarily negative. I rest my case. So you're saying that the wording that they chose was not accurate. Yeah, they, it was. Right. You know, whether they were lying, you know, duplicitous means they right. represented it for something it wasn't. Okay. Right. And so that's to me is more of the issue than anything else. Right. Very, very interesting observation. Stephanie may yet yeah, no Stephanie's approach. So that's why it's that that's why it's troublesome to me. And you know, so it's unfortunate. I find it to be an unfortunate experience because Moshe trusted these individuals. You know, they right. were they were hand chosen because of their leadership and who they were. They were people. Yeah. And all of a sudden they came back and said, you know, it's not what we want you to believe it to be, right? For whatever that would be. And so that to me is an act of cowardice, right? right? And so again, what Rabbi Sachs, because you know we studied it, it was again, it was confidence was the theme of when we went through again Sachs's analysis of right. this of this parsha. Anybody right. else want to contribute to the discussion? Yes, yes. Um, I I want to agree with Robert uh, for another reason. Um, when when we were discussing Rabbi Sachs's analysis, the distinction was made between uh, when uh, with the discussion of the description of the walls being high and well fortified, and it, this uh, it was indicated could mean that they were not so strong and fierce. People build high walls which may be difficult to traverse, but it's an indication that they are somewhat fearful and maybe weak. Right. Even and though they, they may be mighty, they may be not so fierce, they may be internally like weak. Right, I mean prideful and also tall walls means they want to defend themselves yes. from others. Yes. Not that they're fierce again, because fierce people would be you know, fearless. You know, yeah, on. like the better one, they don't need the wall so much. Right, right. That is correct. There, there are definitely commentaries that do, that do say that having a wall actually shows on the people being weak. People who are not scared of anything, right. they don't need a wall because they'll stand up against anyone who, who, um, who, who would, uh, who would try to even who wants to think of starting them. up with them. Right, right. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Phyllis. Right. <laughs> Thank so you. All, so these are all different takes on what where exactly did the did the mission go wrong? So, something went wrong wrong here. Question is at what what point did it go wrong, and how do we you know pinpoint what went wrong? Obviously to fix up uh, for the future. But wasn't Caleb part of that group? He, yes, so he was part of the group, but he was not part of their plot. In other words, he came, right. he did not obviously. agree to them. right, obviously, because yeah. he's you know he's, he's, got, he right. him. he's a minority right. opinion. <laughs> right. So he's one of the ten who, you know, so he's got to have real chutzpah, you know, strength to be yeah. able to go against them. Yeah. So so again, this is to me a story of cowardice in 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 another interpretation of it. Right. There was only one of the ten who you know, wanted to um, stand up, share, right? Exactly, stand up and share what his experience was. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So moving on, we would focus. We're going to focus on a interpretation that appears in the Talmud. A A very interesting sort of startling interpretation, which they the 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 Talmud brings down the following. Let's see. 
here so we have um, all right rabbi hanina bar papa says rabbi hanina bar papa son of papa says the following he's focusing on the verse stronger uh verse the end of verse 31 but the men who went up with him said we are unable to go up against the people for they are stronger than us the hebrew word the exact hebrew wording is ki chazak hu mimenu they are stronger than mimenu interestingly the hebrew word of mimenu could mean two things of us or we or him so typically, in most translations, they would translate the word here, obviously, as us. They are stronger than us. Because what in the world could stronger than him mean in this context? However, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa said that over here, when it says, Mimenu, you should translate as him. Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says, the spies said a serious statement at that moment. When they said they are stronger do not read the end of the phrase to say stronger than us and interpret the Hebrew word of mimenu as us, but rather read it stronger than him. So the Hebrew word of mimenu, which has two interpretations, either us or him, should mean him. Who's him? So what they were implying to say is meaning that even the homeowner who is God, is unable to remove his belongings from there, as it were. The spies were speaking heresy and claiming that the Canaanites were stronger than God himself. So here, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says, it's brought down in the Talmud, that the spy said the, the, that God is, that the, that, even God can't help us in this war. They're stronger than him. They're stronger than everyone, stronger than us, but stronger than him also. Well, wow. how are they able to say this? They just experienced so many miracles. They were, took, they were taken out of Egypt and God split the Red Sea when the Egyptians were chasing after them. Their whole existence in the desert was a miraculous existence. So what went, how were they able to think and say that the, 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 the people that live in Canaan, that live in Israel are stronger than God or stronger than him? How could they even imply such a thing? They experience miracles. They, practically surviving in a desert is a miracle. And like we learned that they had the water from the, from they had they had water from the stone and they had the mun, the food from the fruit the food from heaven. So the whole existence was a was a miracle then. So God can't just perform another miracle, and bring them into the land of Egypt. Right. That this is something which is, which is um, which right away just. What, how, how are they able to say such a thing? So one of, one of the explanations given is that the spies, I think this was also discussed in yesterday's, in yesterday's class, how the spies wanted to stay in Egypt, uh, sorry, in the desert. They wanted to stay removed from phys from physical needs in the in the desert like 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 lifestyle, where they were totally able to devote all their time just to connect to God. They didn't want to have to get involved in the mundane activity. This is also alluded to when they said that it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. So literally, it means that they saw people dying. They reported that people were dying, it's, that it's not a good land. But in a sort of in a more loose translation, 
land here referring to physicality, the physical world. And they're saying, if we move to this land and we're going to have to, you know, plow and harvest and make a living, we're not going to have a miraculous lifestyle. So then we're going to be consumed by that lifestyle. We're going to con be consumed by the earth, by the land, so to speak, quote unquote land. And therefore, they did not want to enter Egypt, uh, enter Israel. So that was sort of their ideology. That was their way of thinking. That's why they wanted to discourage the Jews from living, going into Israel, because Israel, we won't be able to serve and be totally, we won't have a, all the time, we won't be able to connect to God on the same level that we connect to him when we're in the, de when we're in the desert. In the desert, they had nothing to do besides the study Torah. What do, you, what do they do for? What do they do all the time there? They had no worries. Food literally fell from the sky. Water they had, clothing they had. So what do they need? They didn't need anything. So they're able to devote all the time they had to connect to Hashem. So they said, if we go into the land of Israel, we'll be consumed by the land. We would be consumed with the earthly and physical needs, and we don't want that. We want to be totally devoted to, to spirituality. Kalev, on the other hand, said no, just the opposite. The purpose is not being in the desert. The purpose is not being separated from the world and just connecting to God. The purpose is, is to run a normal life, to eventually enter the land of Israel, run a, a normal life, and in that life, in the physical world, having to do with the physical world, connect it to Hashem. So, To say it a little differently, the Miraglin, the, 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 the spies wanted to stay, they wanted to stay in the desert because they wanted to just be totally devoted to Hashem and not have to worry about physical needs. Kalev, on the other hand, said no. The purpose of creation is not to stay to stay separated, is not to is not to you know lock yourself up in a room and just pray the whole day or here in this case, stay in a desert and, and pray the whole time and learn Torah the whole time. The point is, is to, the point is to run a normal life, to have to do with the physical world and having to do with the physical world, connect the physical world to Hashem. Similar to this argument, the, the, the spies also felt that's exactly why we won't, there won't be miracles entering the land of Israel. True, God performed many miracles in the past. He split the sea. Our whole existence in the desert is a miracle. However, entering the land of Israel, that, that's where God says, it's time to leave the realm of miracles and time to enter the natural way of life to enter the physical world. So in other words, they saw it as a, as a split, as, as, a, as a cut, as a split. Just like th there's two ways, there's two lifestyles. There's a lifestyle of the desert, of, spent, of being totally connected and immersed in just in, 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 being, in connecting yourself to Hashem, to God and spirituality. And then there's a lifestyle of entering the land of Israel, a lifestyle of having to do with running a regular physical life and working the field and running a business. And, and, and you have to work to make money. And those two lifestyles are separate and you can't have one. And with, we can't have, you, you can't merge them. And therefore they're like, okay, let's choose 
the desert lifestyle. They also said that in the way God um, in, interferes, uh, the way the way God runs the world, there's also two ways. There's one way. There's a way of miracles, the way the Jews survived in the desert, the way they left Egypt, and then there's the way of nature. When the Jews enter the land of Israel, and they're like, when we enter the land of Israel, there won't be any miracles because that's that's a, that is a a type. That's the, that's the um, that's when has, that's when that's when God defies the rules of nature. But in the rules of nature, then we have to see: is it naturally possible to take over the land and to and to and to fight and to win these people or not? And they said, well, it's not possible. It's not possible. That's what they meant to say. That e that's what they meant to say that even Hashem can take His vessels out of there. Meaning, even the one that created nature, true Hashem created nature and truly performs miracles. But when he wants to, he wants nature to run, run its course. He wants he wants us to enter the land in a natural manner. So now there won't be any miracles. And now we're, so to speak, even he himself is stuck in that order that he created, in that, in that system that he set up. Carlos said, no, you're getting it wrong. True, there are two systems. There's a system of miracles and there's a system of nature. But that system of nature is not removed from miracles. So to speak, even in the system of nature, God could perform hidden miracles. And he could perform, and he, he runs the nature also. And, and, and that's, what he, that's what he responded. That, no, the land is a, is, is a great land. And even though, true, we're entering the land, which means... We're supposed to start a natural way of life, not a desert way of life, a natural way of life. But in that way of life, in that natural way of life, we also have the hand of God. Nature is not disconnected from its source. Nature is not disconnected from its creator. The hand of the creator is also in the natural order of things. And therefore, when it comes to entering the land, even though they're strong and even though even though seemingly maybe naturally you're right but since hashem wants us to enter that land therefore even in the natural way of even in the natural way of order of the way things run hashem's hand will also be there to help us so that was so to speak the another argument or which 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 could be seen between the difference between the spies and Kali that that was that stand up against the spies that disagreed with them. They were saying there's two distinct ways ways of life. There's a desert way of life, and there's an and there's a and have a way of living in Israel when you when you have a place to live an, an, an inhabited place way of life. The desert way of life is a spiritual way. And the entering land is a different way of life. That's a mundane way. That's a physical way of life. And we and it's there's either one or the other. And we're choosing the spiritual way of life, the desert way of life. And they also said that's actually two ways of how God runs the world. There's the miraculous way, where He interfere inter, intervenes and He'll split the sea for us and He'll drop them on the the and He would He would, He'll take care of all our needs. But then there's a natural way. And there, so to speak, his, his hand is removed. He set up this natural order, and now his hand is removed. So, and we want to choose the miraculous way of life. Color said, no, you're getting it wrong. True, there's the, there's the, de there's the desert way of life. But in, the, in the, the other way of life, the, the, the way of, of, of settling the land way of life, that way of life is not removed from spirituality. We have to connect the physical world with godliness. And even there, even in the natural way, the natural order, Hashem's hand is also there and also going to help us. The, the, the hand of Hashem is not only defying nature, Performing miracles, but also in nature, his hand is there, and he would and he would help us. This take on the two sides on on the spies versus Kalev 
is obviously a very strong lesson for every one of us that every person in his life technically has the, his desert part of his life, so to speak. In, in this case, the, the, no, the positive of the desert. In other words, the fact that they had no worries, that everything was taken care of them. So every person has, and, and like we said, what's the advantage of that way of life? That a person could totally focus on spirituality. So there's the time when a person prays or learns, studies Torah, or when he prays to God, he's facing, he's talking to God. So that's my spiritual time of my day. But then I have the rest of my day. So a lot of times we could, we could view it as, a, as two distinct parts of the day. And in my regular, the rest of my day, when I do business, when I run, when I run my life, when, when I just live regularly. So there, that's disconnected from this, my spiritual part of my day. So that's what so, so that's what Kalev is saying. No, we have to connect the two parts of the day. And even in the business, we have to do business in the proper way, and we have to understand and believe that even in the natural order of the world, there's Hashem's hand that leads and and sets things up that it should that it that it should be in the best way possible. All right. Any questions? Sure. Uh, I got it. I seem to be the only dissenter or somebody <laughs> with an alternate um, opinion, but I find that to be a totally defeatist attitude. Um, <laughs> Moses brought us to the, we were wandering for 40 years in the desert. What were we wandering for? To continue to be lost in the desert? Or was he bringing, why were we called the Israelites? Right, because we're being brought to our homeland, to a land that we establish as our homeland to be a nation among nations. And to me, that is so very defeatist. It just, you know, negates, you know, what we believe we are as as Jews and their successors, the Hebrews. What, what do you mean is defeatist? Which well, because you're saying, you know, um, what essentially. God's taking care of them in the desert. They get manna, but then again, you know, they built the golden calf. So things went all rosy in the desert and there was great conflict there. And so Moses was taking us somewhere. These people are negating that because, right. all right, you got to, it doesn't matter, you know, God's providing, what else is God providing or not providing for us to become, you know, a people amongst, a nation amongst nations. So I find no logic in that other than it's, again, a defeatist attitude or undermining what the evolution of who we should have been, who we should right. be as a people. Right. A hundred percent. We're not, we're not saying that was right. Well, just I'm opposite. Saying, we're, explaining, right. we're, explaining, <laughs> we're, we're explaining why it's wrong, but we're Correct. just saying that it was, it didn't come in a vacuum. They also, in other words, even a wrong opinion of the fetus opinion, you could justify it, you know? So right. what was their justification? Their, their justification is like, maybe there's something positive in, in the desert. Of course and, it was wrong. That's why Caleb stood up and that's why Hashem right. got angry. But, but I guess I'm disturbed. I'm concerned that Caleb was not given a more of a leadership, a, a identification in a leadership role yes. versus yes. the greater mass, okay? You're saying he was, he was, he was overshadowed by the well, tent. He was, he was undermined. Okay? Undermined. In the annals of Jewish history, he was undermined, right. okay? So In, that's my concern. Right. Interestingly, he actually uh, later he got a special reward when he him and Yeshua, his peer, which actually didn't speak up, even though he wasn't part of the, there were 12 spies. Right. And Yeshua was them one of them. Right. Yeshua was one of them, but he didn't speak up. Kali was the one that spoke up. And much later, when there are the only two from that age group that entered the land of Israel. And when they entered, Hashem said, like, these are the two people that are entering because they did not follow the plot of the spies. And he also got a special sec section in the land of Israel for many years as a reward for, for keeping his, his base strong and being, staying focused in what was supposed to be done and reported. So, so we should have a, so Caleb's reward was the sequence to what happened in, with the deniers. You know, and so that was the evolution of what did happen. But yeah. again, I guess the question is, 
do we have to have this cluttering of our history to justify that we should be like everybody else? I guess that's the yeah. moral of this story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rabbi, yeah, I I could not agree more strongly with what Robert is saying, and it comes into my mind. I mean, I don't know at what point it was said that we're supposed to be a light unto the nations, but Israel has a higher destiny than some any other Peshitta nation. Uh, yes, they were supposed to live in the land of Israel, but fulfilling a, a spiritual destiny integrated within uh, a, a regular life of tilling the fields and so on and so forth. I mean, because after all, you know, with Matan Torah, we had the agricultural laws that pertain to the land of Israel. I mean, you know, it seems to me that they, they lost the sight of the forest for the trees here. And it bothers me a little bit, really more than a little, that Yahushua did not speak up because I thought he was a leader and he should have, you know, been more supportive of Caleb, it would seem to me. Right. So regarding why Yeshua did not speak up is because ev everyone knew that Yeshua was Moshe's right-hand man. And they wouldn't have let him sp speak. Kalev, who was no one, no, he, he wasn't, Yeshua was, was called the servant of Moshe. He always was his right hand man. He was next to him the whole time. His, his tent, his, his place of living was, 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 was close by Moshe. So they wouldn't have let him speak. Specifically, Kalev, who like no one knew yet, he was the one that was able to get everyone quiet and you know, take the platform and say the opinion of what, uh, of what him and Yeshua thought. And also Yeshua only came a leader when they entered the land of Israel. At this point, he was, he was, he was a leader like many other leaders. He wasn't the, the leader of the nation. He became the leader of the nation many years later. Let's see. All right, so any more questions? Okay, so leave it at that. Everyone... Yeah, Ra Rabbi, I was gonna yeah. say um, in reference to uh, what Robert said, uh, not last time, but the time before when he was talking about the people being fierce. Were they really fierce? Were they not fierce? So in the Medrash, it explains that these people, they were fallen angels, they were giants. And they were terrorizing their country, the country. They, they, had, they ruled with an iron fist. They abused people. They did all kinds of stuff. And they were the angels that uh, Hashem said, you think you could do a better job than people? Go down and see. And they were the worst of the worst because, of their, because of they were giants. So they were, very, they were fierce. And they were, uh, they were horrible. Let's say hello. Okay. And any more comments? Thank you for that input. That um, matters about the Rabbi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I, I it, it harkens back to a sure I listened to many years ago, Rabbi uh, Robinson uh, Bauman. She kept using the term. For people of violence, she kept calling them Anshe Hamas. And she didn't realize at that moment that to my ear, it sounded like Hamas, you know, the terror organization. <laughs> and the way these people are being described here, um, you know, with what David just said, I mean, you know, it's almost like at that point, then these Kananis acted like a terror organization. They were on Hamas also. They were violent, but uh, similar to these that are flogging us today. Interestingly, interesting. Right. Any, any more comments? Is, is there anything in, um, I don't know where this thought takes us, but um, when, when we left Israel, sorry, Mr. Um, 
we were given, you know, our, our calendar, moon, and we were experiencing that we were like masters of time, where the other civilizations are the victim of time. So when we were in the desert, we were in a timeless place. There was no sowing and reaping. So it was something that, that was allowed you to be, uh, to be spiritual. Life is no distractions. When they went to, into Eretz Israel, they saw a time-bound civilization where, you know, they, the, the agriculture was obvious, people died and everything around them, working themselves to death. Is there anything that influenced their thinking that they didn't want to go, they didn't want to be a town, town bound civilization. They wanted to be a free, free from time, as it were. Is there anything in that thought? You're saying free from the... From, from the clock. <laughs> from the clock. You know, like we're all, we're, we're slaves right. of the clock. You know, right. I mean, you know. So, but in the in the desert, they didn't, they weren't sound blind by the top because there was nothing to really ga gauge it by. The seasons were no no perhaps, seasons or anything. Perhaps that that ties into what we we're saying before. Maybe not being bound to the clock is more spiritual in a sense. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. So they were, you know, but when they saw these people who, you know, were absolutely bound by the clock, by the seasons, by the by right. everything else, and they were dying, they're dying or overworked, you know, you could interpret it in many ways. Yeah, correct. I don't know where that thought goes, but... I consider that a cop-out. <laughs> that's my <laughs> attitude. Uh, Rob, um, uh, Robert's uh, saying that it's, who is defe defeatist attitude? Uh, who is, what, what kind of defeatist attitude is it when you want, you're going into a settling in the land you, you want to be a nation among nations. Uh, is that is that defeatist to be a, a you know even a nation as as other nations? After all, once they got in there, they 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 did as other nations did. They 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 established a, a king, and they step they tried to establish a way of life that they that was uh, that they saw all around them, and uh, they wanted to become they wanted to get real. And have responsibilities. What's wrong with that? Why would you call that defeatist? I don't quite uh, understand that, uh, I think that, that they idea. Want to rise up to the occasion. They didn't want to rise up to the challenge. I... That's all I have to say. Um, sir? Yes? Uh, I I'm suggesting that um, it was defeatist in the sense that uh, they didn't want to or else didn't feel they could rise up to the challenge. Yet they actually, if they, if they put their mind to the fact that they had a special mission, maybe they would have had the omen and the confidence to do it. The other thing I wanna ask relative to this that line where it says the land devours its inhabitants, did this relate to the behavior of the Canaanites? Or what exactly? I mean, is there anything in the commentaries about that? Which verse? Oh, it's, um, it's up in the, it's in the first, it's in, it's in the first, the first grouping. Yes. It says the land devours its inhabitants. Right. Oh, what a land they have. I think, uh, I think, is it good or bad is an explanation. What, uh, can I oh, tell you? It says the can land I... we pass through to explore is a land that consumes its inhabitants. Yeah. The, the reason is because God made a miracle that He made a lot of people in the land of Canaan die so that they would not uh, be suspicious of the spies that were spying out the land. So the, they were all busy burying their dead. And God did this as a miracle to help the, the, the spies so that they wouldn't be interfered with by the land of Canaan inhabitants. But instead of taking it as a miracle and a, and a good thing from God, right. 
they said, oh, this is, they look at this, these people are all, we're all busy uh, burying their dead all the time, not so, realizing that it was a kindness from God. Right, but David, they, did they know that or did they purposefully misconstrue the facts? It sound, well, that's a good question. It sounds like they misconstrued because they had an intention right, uh, right. to not, not good in the beginning. Right, not to give outside. a good report, not to come right. back with a good report. Right, yeah. right. But they could have misidentified it. They could have just said, "Look, uh, look, look what we're seeing," not realizing that you know they're being blinded by the fact that God's doing a miracle for them, and they think it's a terrible thing. These people are right. busy burying their dead. It could have been in innocent, uh, even though their end was. But, but that no sort good. of gives a contradiction because they're d described as giants. You know, they're big people. Big people means well. You know, they're they're not needy. They're not you know. I just believe, I just think that the way that the people, the, the, the sons of Adnach are described, giants in some respects is, a res, is, is respectful of them. Not that you're not diminishing their stature, obviously, because you're calling giants, but there's other, other definitions of what, what a giant um, could be. So, you know, it's rife with lots of contradictions, the whole story. It could be both are true. Yeah. Some people well, were... Some they saw giants there, and they also saw not everyone was giants. There were giants there. Yeah, Even some of the giants were giants. can die. The giants were the bosses. The regular folks were not yeah. giants. They were the abused. They were the victims. Do we know that as a fact? I yes. Yeah. Okay. Because, well, yeah. You you, you you have other texts to the to essentially authenticate that. Yeah. It, okay. well, if, you, if you look at the, the, I don't want to go into the whole details, but there's a, yeah, yeah. the story is that, that, that angels challenged God and said, why are you giving the Torah to the Jews? Why are you letting the Jews go into Israel? And after many challenges, God said, you think you could do better? They said, yes. So he asked, so God asked for volunteers. This is all explained in the Medrash. He said, Let, give me some volunteers. A bunch of them volunteers. They were the Nephilim. They were the giants. They went down. And instead of showing that they were able to do a better job than man they were they were the most fierce and horrible people mm -hmm. because they were not only evil but they abused their their size to terrorize everybody to terrorize the country and that's how it came to be the giants okay But, right. but most of the folks were just uh, victims. I think they were they were evil also, but they were uh, they were they were just uh, they weren't the bosses. They weren't the thing people that were running the show. It was the giants running the show. Right. Right. Any anything else? Any more comments? All right. I think we'll stop here. Everyone have a good afternoon and uh, cool. see you next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.